I got to get to our guest though, because we had him on the show. I don't know. It was like a month and a half ago. Thomas McKean, uh, a fabulous, fabulous gentleman who's really been a mover and shaker in the autism community. Um, really the author, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about his book and, and how it really changed a lot of how the autism community was seen. We invited him on last time to talk about individuality and identity. And we, we, there was so much going on. We didn't get very far. And of course I jumped in and asked questions and I talked too much. So I'm going to talk less this time, but I'm going to welcome back Thomas McKean and um, Thomas, how are you today? Uh, oh, oh, there I am. There you Hold are. On. Welcome you... back to Autism Live. Uh, can, can you hear me? Am I here? Yes, I, we can hear you. You're here. Um, and I can, I can go through your bio, but I wanted to leave you more time to talk. Um, should, we t should I say a little bit of the stuff in the bio, or do you want to uh, tell us? Uh, go ahead. I'm, I'm looking at these big ears. I have, uh, I was going to wear these, but uh, the, the battery forgot to charge them. So I, oh, big ears I on. think they look cool. I, you know, the, the kids all <laughs> think the earphones are, are happy. Very retro in uh, a way. <laughs> so you're good. But, uh, you guys need to know that Thomas, uh, was diagnosed in 1979 at the age of 14. And he did three years in an institution, uh, because of autism. And uh, he was eventually, uh, once he got himself out of that institution, ran for and was elected to the National Board of Directors for the Autism Society of America. And at that time, they were the world's largest autism advocacy organization. He served two non-consecutive terms, and uh, a la Grover Cleveland, I like that, Thomas, from 1992 to 1994 and 97 to 2000. He's a speaker, a keynote speaker at various autism conferences around North America, uh, both on his own and alongside Temple Grandin and other notable advocates. And he's also uh, someone who does regular consulting for families and school systems throughout the USA and Canada. And uh, he was one of the people that was part of creating the original puzzle piece, which I know you take a... You take a, a lot of guff about Thomas. Maybe we need to talk about that. Uh, he's actually written two books. I was going to let you talk about those, though, because uh, I want to hear more from you and not from me. Uh, so talk to us, Thomas. We're so thrilled and honored that you're back Look with us. At, uh, what's, her, what's her page, Florine? Do I have that right? Uh, the one that was asking about why her 13-year-old grandson always forgets. He told her to write more, and she says, asking him to put deodorant on in the morning. Yeah, uh, do you want to answer that? Um, that? That's kind of given me flashbacks to a couple of conversations Temple and I have had. Uh, one of them, of course, is her classic story. I'm sure you've heard it, about how she was going to work, and uh, the boss uh, kind of gave her talking to because she didn't have the deodorant on. I'm sure you've heard that story. Yes. And uh, she gave me a talking to one day. The first time I heard that story, uh, I was we were we were at a a conference speaking together. I think it might have been one of those dog and pony show Future Horizon conferences we did back in the day. And I love those, by the way. Re you remember them, the ones with me I and. And, uh, I, Carol love and those. I love a good Future Horizon conference. Absolutely love them. Um, but uh, did she, she said something to you about how yeah, you smell? Because uh, just like uh, I'm looking at it here, uh, oh, her grandson, it says, uh, says he forgot that particular day. I forgot to shave. This is my favorite Temple Grandin story. I've got a bunch of them, but this one is my favorite. So I'll start the, the, the uh the event here by telling you my favorite temple grandin story okay and i i uh for whatever reason i guess i was in a hurry or whatever i kind of you know forgot to shave and i was in the hallway and i was walking one way temple was just walking the other it was just a coincidence we happened to pass each other and as as we got close temple stopped me and she said, 
in that temple grand and voice. You look like a complete slob. And how did that make you feel? I didn't get it at first because I didn't really understand where she was. I like, do I have something on my shirt? Do I? What happened? And then she told me, told me that I didn't shave, and she told me the story about you know the the deodorant. And by that time, you know, um, you know, the conference had started and I was going to be on and it was too late. So I had to do the talk without shaving. But uh, Temple was not pleased with me. I'm, I'm pretty sure she would remember that. She was, she was not happy with me that day. And did that resonate, though, with you, Thomas, for her when the teacher called her out and said, you know, you can't come in here smelling bad? that changed for her. And then she's been very, very specific about making sure that she looks presentable and smells presentable. Did it change for you as a result of her saying something? Um, you know, I guess it, I guess it did. Um, I, there have still been times that I presented that uh, I have, uh, I haven't, but I, I think that I do, you know, you know, shave uh, more often now because of because of that comment that she made to me. It's 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 just kind of, and I'm sure every guy can relate to this. It's just not something that I enjoy doing. Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to the whole thing about you know we only do things if we get something out of it, and well, it's like you the carrot of the I'm stick, gonna right? There, I'm going to be up there talking to people on the stage it's going to be to my benefit to look presentable. Right. I would get something out of it in that situation. And in that sense, she was right. And so are you. Well, but, but I think sometimes in, as we go through life, there are some things that everything can't occur to us all the time. Um, but I find it interesting that when, you know, if somebody says something to you and it suddenly matters to you, I think that's when behavior change happens. Not necessarily because the person said something. I think it has to be the double thing of someone brought it up and it matters. Do you agree, yeah, Thomas? I, it, might also, it might also be also who brings it up. I mean, you know, Temple and I don't agree on everything, but I do have a great respect for her. And, yeah. you know, it might have been part of it too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know for my son, when he was a teenager, there were aspects of the self-care thing that, you know, it just wasn't on his radar. And it, and it wasn't until a girl um, said something to him. And it wasn't a girl that he was particularly interested in, but it was just a girl who was looking at, because his guy friends weren't going to say these things to him, right? But a girl said something, and then all of a sudden, he realized that other people were looking at him and thinking things. And uh, then then he wanted to take better care of himself. But uh, to answer that question, because I understand I am supposed to be interactive today, to answer that question off to the side, uh, Jacob, I think, uh, the institution was for the uh, mentally disabled, which I think autism qualifies more as a neurological disorder, but they were still putting them in those places back then. Uh, he's talking about how uh, they were back in the 50s and they closed down back in the 80s for abuse allegations. Uh, this one was in the 80s. It was in the 80s I was there, and uh, it has since closed down. I've, I've been back on the grounds once since then. Um, it was in the 80s. It was, I think, uh, 80 to 83, I think. And yes, like those others, it, it has closed down. So I hope that answers his question. Absolutely. Although we want to say that there are still some pretty terrifying places that are still open, like the Judge Rottenberg Center. My God, what is it we have to do to get that place to close? Uh, just horrible. Um, but in any case, Thomas. They have, they have had dealings with the Judge Rottenberg Center. I'm sorry, what did you say? The ASA has had uh, situations with them. Back when they were uh, BRI, I think, what was it, Behavior Research Institute or something like that? Before it was the Judge Rottenberg Center, but it was the same place. They were, uh, they were, they were in the exhibit hall at a conference. Did we talk about this 
last time. I think I don't might've... remember. It makes my blood boil, so I don't remember well, that. They had this. Uh, they they were in the exhibit hall, and they had this booth. This was at ASA National in 92, 93, something like that. It was back, it was a long time ago. And they had out on the table, they had like these, um, how can I put this politely, accoutrements, let's say. And I picked up and I held it in my own little hands this little device that is designed to squirt lemon juice into your eyes if you're bad. And I, that was, I just I picked this up and I looked at it and I thought, why am I even holding this thing? I put it back. How down. horrifying! That has to have made you sick to your stomach, Thomas. I I just oh I can't even. Uh, and the fact I, that that place is still alive and doing business makes me full on nuts every day. But yeah, ASA caught a lot of flack for um, good allowing them in, and there was uh, a lot of discussion about it in the boardroom after that conference. And they were they were banned. We banned them from the conference. And um, far as I know, um, at least during my five years with ASA, those are the only people that we ever banned from the conference. Yeah, but but they deserved it. So good on you guys for doing that, Thomas. I want you to have time to talk about what you want to talk about today. So what's the first thing you want to talk about? Um. Well, let's talk about Autism Awareness Month. You mentioned that. They, they kind of go together, the two things that I want to talk about. They kind of, I, I wrote a little note here. You were talking earlier. I made a note. Um, oh, there it is. Here it is, a little quote you said. Uh, Autism Awareness Month could be whatever you want it to be. I kind of agree with that. And, uh, you know, a little while ago, a few years ago, I think I had a problem with people calling it um, you know, Autism Acceptance Month or Autism Action Month or Autism Advocacy Month, I've heard. And uh, because when we put that together, uh, we made it Autism Awareness Month for a reason, and that was because we wanted to to promote awareness of, of autism. Which, and the reason that we picked April uh, if it's not obvious, we had, I don't know, like maybe 12 choices, I think. And uh, we narrowed it down to two, April and August, because they both start with A, like like autism. And uh, from there, it, we, it was easy to choose April because it was springtime, new beginnings, and a better time for uh, conferences and events and fundraisers. And that's why uh, it's in April. So a little... Uh, a little Autism Awareness Month trivia for you guys out there. But uh, over the past couple of years, I've really kind of mellowed on that. And I've kind of come to understand that it's not, it's not what you call it. You can, like you said, call it whatever. It's really kind of more the spirit behind it. And I... I didn't think it was going to go anywhere when we when we made it because the incidence was a lot lower than it was like one in something thousand. I think it's one in forty four now, isn't it? I, it was one in something thousand then, and I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. And I've over the years, I've just watched it take off, and I've been kind of amazed by that and 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 seeing what people have done with it and the money that they raise and the awareness that they raise and the events that they have. I think it's really cool what people have done with it over the years. My internet cut out for a second, Thomas, so I missed part of what you said. I apologize. Um, but yes, you are right that it's one in one in 44, uh, one in 43, I think, boys. Um, Kathy has written in, and I'm trying to answer you, Kathy, and my internet went crazy, and uh, Pharrell wants to know if, uh, if you would answer Florine's question, but I feel like you already did, but let's well, ask. Well, I didn't really answer it, and it's uh, Farrell Brody. Hello, Farrell. Uh, good to see you. Farrell requested the link to this. He wanted to, to be on, so I sent it to him. Um, the, I, I think he's asking about um, is it is it the question about why her grandson forgets? Are we back? I, yeah, I, but, there, I, but he wants to know what you would do. 
what would you do about it? Oh, what would I do if he forgot? Uh, you were talking about visual supports earlier. That's a good as answer as any. You know, if you see something that helps you remember. Yeah, um, absolutely. You can, you can try that. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, that's that's kind of a, a, a common thing that parents do. You know how they have these little boards and they have the little pictures that give you the little step by step that tell tell their kids how to do something. Um, there's a name, a clinical name for that. I don't remember what it is, but uh, apparently it's very effective. Yeah. And, and, you know, you might want to play around with where you and what visual support, like some people, it would just be text on the, on the bathroom mirror. Don't forget to put deodorant on for another person. It might be a, a cartoon drawing of their arm deodorant going on. Uh, it could be at the front door that there's a picture of the deodorant. I mean, think about all the different places, all the different ways that you could um, have that. Now, Kathy has written in and said that not only will her son not cut his uh, hair, that his hair is a bush, he won't get a haircut, but she also wants to know if anybody has had um, their teen evaluated for driving ability. And my internet went nuts, but I was trying to write back to you, uh, Kathy, and ask uh, a question if your if your son is riding a bicycle. That's my question. But Thomas, do you want to talk about haircuts or the bicycle? Um, or not the bicycle, the driving? I could sort of relate to the haircuts. I mean, I got over it at some point, but I, I guess maybe I haven't. I still don't like getting my haircut, and I usually wait until it's so in my eyes. Farrell, who is on here, he can tell you. He's seen the long hair. Uh, I usually wait until I, it's just so annoying in my eyes the last minute to get it cut because I just it, it's not something that I like. It's it's a uh, and, and I've talked about this at, at conferences before because it's a common question that that you get there. You know, my kid doesn't like to get his hair cut. What can I do? And it's 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 kind of a physically painful kind of thing. And um, and you know, sometimes the the smarter, more knowledgeable people say, well, how can that be? Because hair is dead cells and you wouldn't feel it. And they're right about that. And I've wondered about that over the years. I have a theory, can't prove it. It's just a thought that maybe this is just a wild guess. Maybe someone who knows more, they're watching about neurology and the way things work and say, you know, maybe he's right or this guy's absolutely nuts or something. I'm wondering if it might be vibration from the scissors cutting the hair going down the hair and getting scalp. Yeah, I, I think that's very plausible. Plus, which, you know, I'm somebody who had very curly hair all throughout my life. And, and you know, it, we could say that it doesn't actually hurt the ends of the hair. But I don't know about you, Thomas. Whenever they were cutting my hair, they were pulling on it. And my scalp would hurt. So, well, there is that, too. Yes. There's that too, and um, there are uh, there are some people that are are better about that than others, and there are um, there's there's this one place. Um, it used to be called the Puzzle Piece Salon until she took too much heat for it, and then she changed it. Are you familiar with this? I can't remember where it's located. I think it's a parent. I think it's a parent who. Um, who understood that that her her child was having problems, and she kind of opened up this 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 uh, salon, this hair place, and she kind of caters to to people with autism specifically, and kind of uh, modifies the haircut, if you will, to make it a little yeah. less traumatic. There's a lot of sensory barbers now. Um, there there was Jim the barber over in England that started a whole movement of training barbers to be more sensory sensitive. So it is the kind of thing that you can kind of look up and, and Kathy does say his hair is curly. Um, so, you know, I'm always someone Thomas that I'm like, pick your battles. As long as they keep it clean and they can see, I, you know, I know it's, it's hard sometimes because we have an idea in our head of what we want our kids to look like, but you know, it's not necessarily who they want to look like or how they feel comfortable. Um, 
I'm somebody who cannot, I, I keep, I cut my own hair at this point because I can't stand to have my hair long. Other people can't stand to have it short. I think it's a pretty personal thing, but if there are other guidelines like keeping it um, so that you can see and clean, what do you think about that, Thomas? Let him, let him have it a little longer. What do you think? I think, I think you're absolutely right about that. Pick your battles. I mean, that's, those are like, three of the top words in all of autism is pick your battles. And, it, and they always have been. My hair, I think, is a little too short. Uh, I, I went to get it cut and because um, I was doing a, a song at the, at the, at the church, a, a Unitarian church. I went to get my hair cut for that. And uh, the place that I usually go to is closed. So I went somewhere else and there was this lady that I'd never seen before. And she said, well, do you just want to trim? And I said, yes. And she cut it. It hasn't been this short in over 40 years. Wow. Uh, but people are telling me they like it. So yeah, I don't know. Maybe good. short is in now. And, and Kathy was saying she was just curious. But I think a lot of folks on the spectrum, that getting their hair cut is not the favorite thing. Wouldn't you say that? Thomas? Uh, th th that matches my experience, yes. Um, I, I, it doesn't apply to everyone, but there are several out there who, uh, who, who don't really fancy getting a haircut. And as to, the, as to the driving, Thomas, do you drive? Have you ever been a driver? I do. Uh, I was a little late. What I remember is getting a license at 18, not 16, like everyone else in Ohio, here where I am. So I was a couple of years late and, um, you know, I've been in an accident or two. Not all of them were my fault. Um, one guy uh, pushed me off the road on uh, Interstate 71 and I hit the beam and his car rolled over down the freeway. Um, but as you can see, I survived that. Um, uh, I'm not really. Uh, I'm not really sure um, what to, what to say about that. Um, I uh, one thing that comes to mind is the the senses of of uh, people with autism are not really designed to to be able to process rapid information, and I think that can be a problem with driving because. You know, you have to kind of, you're, you, you got the wheel and you kind of got to pay attention. You got to look around and you have to listen. And there's cars going by you at these fast speeds. And sometimes the sirens coming at you from you don't know where. So you really have to, to uh, be able to compensate for that if you want to be a good driver, I think. And there are some who can. Yeah. I haven't been back in a ticket in years. But there, but there are a lot of people who either don't feel that they're up to driving or that their family doesn't think that they're up to driving or they just choose not to. And this is both on the spectrum and not on the spectrum. And Jacob asked the question, is it okay not to have a license or to be able to drive? In today's society, I think it's totally acceptable. What do you think, Thomas? I, I think um, in any society, it should be. I mean, that, that, that I think to be a personal choice, kind of like the hair we were talking about earlier. And especially if they're doing it for safety reasons, then how could you not be in favor of it? So uh, if someone is out there saying, you know, I just would rather not, or I don't think it would be okay for me to do this, I think it's, it's a good thing to honor that. Yeah, I think that going back to the listening with all your senses, I think we need to hear that and go, it's okay. I right. do want to say, though, that in terms of evaluating whether somebody is ready to drive or able to drive, the state of Louisiana has technology that they were doing research on that was, um, I don't know if the research is done at this point, but there, there was a driving simulator that was uh, designed specifically to evaluate whether someone had the capability to process the information to be a good driver. Um, I haven't seen that be any place else but Louisiana. But one of the things that I've heard experts talk about here is that, you know, if your child is able to successfully ride a bicycle with no training wheels, 
that um, and to manage riding a bicycle out in public that then then you can start having the conversation. But if they're not able to do that, then you should do that first uh, before you even start talking. Apparently, there's a lot of people that the kids weren't able to successfully ride a bike, but jumped ahead to vehicles. And I've not heard that going well. So uh, uh, the, the one thought that occurs to me with that, though, and this is the complexity of autism, because nothing in autism is ever easy. Yeah. One thought that, that occurs to me, and I might, no, I don't think I'm wrong about this. Um, one thought that occurs to me is uh, vestibular dysfunction. And to ride a bike, you have to be able to balance on the two wheels. You were just saying just a minute ago about the training wheels. I'm not sure that applies to driving the car because when you're driving the car, you're sitting down, you're on four wheels, there's no balance required. They're so sure that right. the reason they might not be able to ride the bike might not be information processing that might be vestibular processing. So if change that criteria then to need to be able to successfully ride a bike with or without training wheels, would you feel better about that? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I, I mean, I might. It's hard um, to have a, a be all end all because everybody's different. Well, it is. I it's it's hard for me to picture um, someone driving, you know, riding the bike along the street at any kind of regular bike riding speed with training wheels on. There are I, there are bikes now that are bigger bikes that they're 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 big tricycles. Um, oh, I've seen them. I've, that I've seen that, um, yeah, that are that are kind of cool. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, I want I want to get back, Thomas, to the things that you wanted to talk about because we're already running out of time. Uh, so, in terms of this this month, did you have more that you wanted to say about autism and what what we're calling? There is one other month? thing I wanted to say. You're looking at it on your list, I'm sure. Um, I wanted to talk about this um, thing happening in the autism community, speaking for others. Um, I can't, I, I have a problem with this. And uh, the reason for that being is, you know, I can't speak for Shannon. I can't tell people, you know, Shannon's in favor of this or Shannon's against that or this is what Shannon thinks about this or this is what Shannon feels about that because I don't know. To my knowledge, we've never actually met in person. I don't think we have. Um, I met so many. We may have. I don't remember. No, we haven't met in person only. Okay, good. Only I wouldn't want to upset you by forgetting. No, 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 no. no. But, um, you know, we, but, but I don't know you and there's there's people who are speaking for, you know, the autism community out there saying, you know, this is what the majority of autism think and feel. And it's never anything positive. As you know, it's always something negative. It's not what people with autism, you know, feel good about or, or who or what they love or care about. It's always something negative, what they don't like, what they hate what they would rather not see. And it's always coincidentally what that particular individual feels. My understanding is that the current estimate is that there's about 70 million people with autism, if you consider all of us everywhere, which means that for them to say that, they would have to know for sure how, how over 35 million of them feel about something. And on top of that, um, I just heard, I think it was just yesterday or the day before, someone was telling me that when the CDC updated the numbers to the one in 44, this part I didn't know. Apparently, they're saying that now 40% um, also have some kind of uh, intellectual disability. I think that number might be a little high. I think it might be a little lower, maybe not by much. But, you know, those are the ones who who may not even be able to tell us what they think or feel about, about anything, or even if they care one way or the other about any particular topic. So what I'm what I'm trying to tell your your 
your viewers and your listeners here is um, because of that. Uh, oh, and also uh, add this to it. Um, if you're going to speak for someone else, you you, you kind of need authority to do that. You know, if you if you share and say, okay, you're going here, you can tell somebody that I said this, then yes, I can do that. But um, none of us want people speaking for us and saying things for us that are not true and things that we don't feel and don't believe. And um, it's it's very rare to to get the authority to speak for the autism community. Very few people have had it. I am one of them, but it has long since expired. And I speak only for myself now because I know not to speak for others because I don't want others speaking for me. So what I'm saying here, long-winded as I'm being, I'm really trying to be as nice as I can about this, is the people who are telling you the majority of um, the people with autism feel this way or that way. Uh, no, they don't know. They're just kind of saying it. And it's something that's happening this month all over social yeah. media. And it's it's bugging me and it's bugging others. And, you know, it's, it's going back to the, the attacks and the bullying that all of us have seen and aren't happy with. It's a really hard topic. I got to say all the way around, you know, I think as much as we don't know each other well, Thomas, I, I read what you write and heard a little bit of what, what I have to say here. And I, you know, I always say I want to listen to folks who are on the spectrum. I just want to listen. I want to be a student in the front row. But there you are said times. That earlier. You said that a few minutes yeah. ago when you started. Yeah. I, I always want to listen. But there are times when I will be someplace, whether it's in a conference or here, and um, and while I'm listening, I, you know, I have an agreement with my son. We talk about what I'm allowed to say and what I'm not allowed to say um, on a daily basis, uh, because it's not okay for me to be here and talk about him without that conversation. Um, and I ask him on a daily basis, what words do you want me to use when I'm talking about you in relation to autism, right? And my son is, so he's 18 and he's part of a generation. There was a generation before him of people who referred to themselves as autistic. Um, right. My son, my son never did. In fact, when he was very young, a, a reporter who was interviewing him referred to him as autistic. And he, he said, I, I am not autistic. I have autism. Those have been his words. I didn't give them to him. Those are his words. Um, but I'll be someplace and I'll say something about uh, my my son. You know, I used to say, you know, that he had autism and and people would interrupt me and say, that's inappropriate. You shouldn't say that. He's autistic. And then I would be in that space where I would have to say, I'm sorry, I will refer to you that way. But this is at my son's request. And then they tell me, well, that's not valid. That You're right. I'm a Right. And right. then I, and go, if, I go, oh, I don't know what to do now. <laughs> right. And if, if there is someone, any individual person who has a preference one way or the other, yes, you honor that. Yeah. You, you absolutely do honor which way they, they, would, they would personally like to be referred to because they can do that for themselves. Yes. But as you, just, as you just mentioned, here was someone trying to do it for someone else and they were wrong about that. Um, back in back in the early '90s, I think it was around the same time we had that incident with the Judge Rottenberg Center. Um, this whole political correctness thing happened, and there was talk in the ASA boardroom. You know, how do we how do we do this? How do we how do we refer to you? Do we refer to 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 to, to them as autistics or or people with autism? And I think there was like over an hour's discussion about that. Um, they asked me about it, and at the time, uh, I said I said autistic. I, my my thoughts on that have changed since then to the point that it really doesn't make that much of a difference to me. And in the end, though, and I think this even went up for a vote, they decided on person with autism, 
their motivation for doing that was they were they were by saying a person with autism you know trying to convey that you know respect to the person and say you know we see you as a as an individual as a person not as not as a condition that you may have and they they were thinking that if they they referred to someone as autistic that it would in a sense be an identity and at that time it was absolutely utterly completely totally inconceivable that anyone would want that as an identity times have changed but back then it was it was thought to be um very inconsiderate and disrespectful um to to think of a person as as their their um any kind of disability or 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 disorder or condition first before before the person if i'm making sense i hope so so no, because you're totally of that making sense. yeah because of that and it went up for a vote and i voted in favor of it because i understood where they were coming from because of that they decided to go with person with autism and um i don't know if that's changed but i know that at least for a time with asa that was a that was a policy person first because because you are a person first yes but there is a whole group of of individuals who say that do that that you're saying you're ashamed of who you are and that that's why they are saying please refer to me as autistic and i believe in you tell me like what words to use to describe you and i need to honor those and it doesn't matter if we're talking about autism or we're talking about gender or whatever you tell me how how you want yourself referred to and and i ask people all the time how would you like what words would you like me to use to describe you and they'll say i'm a person i'm You're a right. person you're right. right. And, and, and nowadays, I kind of like that. Nowadays, yeah. people are even asking about pronouns, which was also completely inconceivable back then. It just didn't happen. Yeah. You know, exactly. if you remember the early 90s, there, there's, that just wasn't there. Oh, and, not at all. Um, but, and, and I understand, they think I don't understand where they're coming from with this and, and the identity and wanting to be proud of who they are. I do get where they're coming from with it. What I don't get is is the the uh, the bullying and and the um, the attacks and the making demands. I just kind of think that's the wrong way to go about getting what you want. Understand that that what we were doing with ASA is we were saying person with autism not um, as any kind of disrespectful way, but just the opposite. When we put the puzzle piece together, we did that not as a, uh, and I think we did talk about this last time, not as anything disrespectful, but the opposite. It was, we did it as, as respect. I think that was the third generation, the third um, iteration of the puzzle piece and the previous two were one piece, you may remember them, they had the crying child inside them. And we did away with that. We did yeah. away with that because by that time we had learned more and we understood more about what autism was and we no longer felt it was appropriate. And we wanted to be respectful to the autism population. And one of the ways we did that was to remove the the crying child and replace it with with you know symbolism that we felt was more appropriate yeah it's so hard because when we're talking about a community as large and diverse as as the autism those on the spectrum and the people who love them right like right i i feel like there's there's like the community of people who are on the spectrum and that's the main community but then there's a bigger community of people around them who love them. And I group them all together in a, in a separate community that I call the bigger autism. community. Because I think that if we, if we all could get to the place where we respect each other's differences, who, what could we teach the rest of the world? Right. You're, and there was a time, there was a time when we were there or very close to there 
and then now now we're not it's kind of moved it's it's like there's this this war between between yeah, I don't think I was the when we were the people the who thing. love them and that's just that's just not right we should be no. working together and you know all throughout this month as I've had guests on and I've said what do you you know what do you think the biggest issue in the autism community is this is what everybody says that there is division within that isn't that isn't productive and that when you whittle it all down, it all comes down to understanding and respecting individuals, right? That on both sides, everybody and respecting needs to, their choices. Yeah. Yeah. And the way they language themselves and, you know, and that, that it's called a spectrum. And that if we could get to the point where we all honored that the fact that it is a spectrum and that, you know, who you are on this spectrum is different than anyone else on this spectrum. And that if we could get to the point where we just valued that and didn't question it, didn't try to minimize it, diminish it, or bully it into being something else on the spectrum, I think we would be able to change the world. I totally agree with that. <laughs> and, uh, and Amanda... How do we get there, Thomas? <laughs> I, um, I... I don't know. Yeah, I, don't I don't know. know. You know, I, I think a couple of years, maybe three or four years ago, I might have had some ideas because we were a lot closer. Yeah. But we're so far away from it now that I don't know. And yeah. Amanda, do you see what Amanda wrote? Amanda's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, she says, we are all here to support our loved one. Puzzle pieces, infinity signs, blue or colorful. We are all just bringing awareness, acceptance, and action. That's right. And it doesn't, it's just like what you call Autism Awareness Month. If you want to call it Autism Acceptance Month, the NCSA calls it Autism Action Month. What you're doing is you're, you're bringing awareness, you're trying to make the world a better place for the population. And you can do that if you choose to do the puzzle piece, the infinity, the blue, the colorful, or nothing at all, you yeah. know? As long as you are, um, you know, and, and maybe not even bringing awareness, but just um, being aware of the awareness and accepting others like we were talking about, that's really what matters. Absolutely. You know, the, the symbols and, and words and, and, and things like that, they, I, I understand how there's an emotion behind them. But, but to me, they're kind of on the surface. And I say that as one of the people who, who did the puzzle piece. What's, what's, what matters is what's underneath it. And the, the, the more um, salient things like, like understanding those differences and, and, and being okay with the differences and, and seeing that, that just because there may be differences in someone that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a bad person or that they're unworthy. It's just that they're a little different and that's okay. To me, that's the important part of all of this. Yeah. So let me, we're out of time, but I'm going to keep you a couple of minutes longer if it's okay. I, I want to ask you about a couple of different terms and just have you tell us how you, not the entire community, but how you feel about them. How uh, do you, you, want, you want to know how Thomas feels. I want to know how Thomas feels. Yeah. How do you feel about uh, the word neurodiverse and neurodiversity? I think the term has been hijacked to some extent, um, but I have been told by enough people that I have respect for that um, that the word is is still valid, and um, I. I think I'm okay with it. I mean, I understand what it means, and I I think that there is such a thing as neurodiversity. I think it would be a little nuts to say that that it doesn't exist because it obviously does. And um, I, how do you mean? Am I okay with it? What do you What do you? Can you give me a context well, there? I mean, here's the thing that, that I try to listen. And I, um, and I try to adapt because the last thing, when I wake up in the morning, the last thing that I want to do is ever offend anybody or hurt their sense of identity. And, and the next phrase that I was going to ask you about is self-advocate because I've been using that term 
for years um, that I thought was a respectful uh, way of, of referring to somebody <clears throat> and say that, you know, so-and-so is a, is a self-advocate. I thought that that was a term of respect. And then someone that I respect and listen to posted the other day on Facebook and said that it's ableist to call someone a self-advocate. Uh, okay, well, I, I thought, call- oh, no. I, I could talk a little bit about, I just got a little thing pop up on my computer saying the battery level and this is okay. critical. So it may All go right. out and switch to the other microphone if that happens. Yeah, okay. But to answer that question, I personally have never really liked that term. I understand okay. it and I know where they're coming from. But in my mind, Thomas is not and has never been a self-advocate. He is an advocate and that's a that work is something that I am proud of doing. The advocacy that I've done, the difference I've made is something that I am proud of. I, I don't see myself as a, as a self-advocate, although I know I am. To me, it's not, it's not that, to me, it's not that Thomas has autism. To me, it's Thomas was able to do this for these people. And maybe those those two, I guess they do go together because one could not have happened without the other. But I, I've i never personally, I, I don't think it's ableist. Let me say that before this goes out. I absolutely do not think the term self-advocate is ableist. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't think the puzzle piece is ableist. These things that people are saying are ableist, I don't think they are. But, and I don't have a problem with other people using the term self-advocate. And I've never really said anything when people have used it in reference to me because it hasn't bothered me that much. It's just something that I've never considered myself to be. Well, Thomas, we are that that alarm is that we're officially out of time. We have to get off. But see, we're just going to have to have you back on a regular basis. Because there's so well, much. I'd be happy to come back. There we go. Uh, we didn't even talk about your books. Traven's got them. They're ready to put up on the screen. Uh, tell us a little bit about these two books and where we can get them. Uh, one of them, the of uh, the second one, Light on the Horizon. It's not out of print. It is on hiatus. I understand, but that might as well be the same thing. I don't see it coming back soon, um, and I'm okay with that because I'm not really happy with it. The other one, Soon Will Come the Light, Literary Achievement Award, uh, got me on Oprah. Um, definitely changed perception of autism back when it was released in 94. That one I, I am happy about and proud of. And it's still available um, on Amazon and I think from Future Horizons. Yeah. So, uh, it's so about- that's the one you would like for us to read. Soon yeah, well, soon. well, you might be able to find the other one. It'll be difficult. Soon Will Come to Light is uh, kind of a biography. I've had, a, I've had an amazing life, even more so since it was published. But, you know, there's, a, there's some, there's, uh, this is who Thomas is, and, it, and there's also a lot about, you know, my personal take, not speaking for others, because we've talked about that, just Thomas's take on, on what autism is and where uh, these symptoms and behaviors and things are coming from and what you can do about it. And um, things like that are all in there. And I follow you on Facebook, Thomas, because I just, it's almost like my daily devotional that I read what, whatever it is you're writing about and uh, it uplifts me. So, uh, but where do we, does everybody, everybody should follow you on Facebook or where can they find you? Uh well, last time around, someone put up a little Facebook link on the screen. Um, you can follow me there or my own site. Um, what is your, do you, you mean you have a website? Because I don't know about that. If you dot com. It would be, you see that? I, we, I do remember this last time. I'm pointed right there. I think I'm pointed right to it. And, and, uh, Tom, and Trayvon is working on it. One, so say yeah, say it again. Word. ThomasAMcKean.com, all one word without the period that you see in my name there. Okay, so ThomasAMcKean.com. Um, right, one more quick thing before I go. Um, yeah. I also wanted to mention, and I thought of this because 
it was it yesterday he posted about Doreen's birthday. Was yes. that yesterday? Yes. yes, I thank you. Yeah, there it is. Um, I wanted to mention um that made me think of something. I said I have to tell I have to tell Shannon this on the podcast tomorrow. Um, a lot of the stuff that is happening out there in the autism community is happening because people are angry. And I get that. I know anger. I know rage. Ask Doreen. She has seen it from me. But um, but what I, what I finally figured out, and what I was angry about specifically, she'll tell you this too, I was angry about people who claim to, to, to practice and follow and believe in a doctrine of love who were doing horrible, horrible things to other people. I was angry about that. I was angry about man's inhumanity to man and the cruelty that I was seeing coming from people who profess to love their neighbor. That was making me angry. But but I I didn't like what that anger was doing to me. I didn't like the person that it was making me. And what I realized is that my anger is not going to change that. It's not going to change them. And the the only thing that I could do about it was to be kind myself. And so I kind of tried to shift gears into kindness a little bit. And I'm still kind of working on that. I'm trying to figure out still what kindness is. You know, you've been reading the post, so I think I've I've been getting better at that. And there's like thousands, thousands of people have been flocking to that page since I yeah. kind of did. And um, you know, th th I think I, the the way you change things is not by anger and it's not by rage. The way you change the world is through kindness and yeah. through 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 being being kind and, and loving each other, even the people that you don't agree with, which can be a very difficult thing to do. And I can do that to some extent, but some people are still making me angry enough. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm working yeah. on it. And, but to um, clarify, Thomas, it, uh, I'm yeah. assuming it was not Dr. Grand Pichet that you were angry at or that you no, think was no. cruel. I, you know, yes, I will clarify. It was not <laughs> it's her. clear that it wasn't. Because I know she has love for you. And I, I think that, you know, you were saying happy birthday. We want to be clear. Well, well, she was oh, not the person you thought. I What's didn't that? Know that? I didn't know that she felt that way about me. Uh, hello. Yes, but, she was so excited when we were having you on before. Yeah. So, so, so what I'm saying is, I, she has seen that from me, and and I I'm try I've gotten over the anger, and I am trying to figure out figure out what kindness is and how to be kind. Obviously, I had some idea because I couldn't have done the things that I did if I didn't know. But I'm trying at this point in my life to put more of a focus on 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 kindness and being good to others because i really think that's the way you make a difference amen amen and Farrell says amen as well thomas it's always delightful and we have you know uh we'll we'll have you back maybe you know maybe we can find a time once a month where you can come and just share thomasism i i i would do that i i would come back there we go. Look, look, I even got an amen. Oh, look, and Amanda gave me a thank you. How could I yes. not? Come and Florine that? gave a thank you. So yes. we're touching uh, lives. Florine. Uh, and then this show will then be available as podcast and have even a much bigger audience. So you'll touch all of those lives. So Thomas, thank you so much. Uh, we encourage people to follow you and and to read. Uh, you know, one or both of those books, uh, and you guys can go to Future Horizons. Uh, I I love me some Future Horizons. Future Horizons is publishing my book that's coming out in July, so it's like oh, one stop. Like How about yeah. that? So yes. you guys can go to Future Horizons. Soon will come the light. Was their first my book launched a little publishing empire. Well, now yes. Now there is a publishing empire, and I think it's where all the best autism books are. I, so. I had no idea that would happen. I'm so proud of them. I'm so proud of them for what they've done. Well, look what you've started. Just, they've just become huge. I know. And it's kind of amazing, all the different things. We're, we're featuring a bunch of different Future Horizon authors uh, the next couple of months. So 
you guys can check them out here. But Thomas, thank you so much for taking the time and for uh, asking, uh, answering all the questions that people wrote in. Thank you to all of you for asking the questions. Don't forget tomorrow. Oh, this week, you guys, tomorrow we have Dr. Doreen Grampiche is going to be with us. And then on Wednesday, guess who's going to be with us on Wednesday, Thomas? I would imagine my first guest would be my friend Temple. No, she's on next Monday. So she'll oh, really? be on, well, a- who's on Wednesday. It's her mom, Eustacia Cutler, is on on Wednesday. Oh, I've met her. Nice lady. Isn't she- uh, so that will be on Wednesday. If you've ever wondered about, uh, as she was on the show once before, if you've ever wondered about Temple Grandin's mom, you don't have to anymore. She's going to be with us on Wednesday. So that's how the week is shaping up. I got to sign off now or Traven's going to get the hook. But thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Thomas. We'll be back tomorrow with Dr. Doreen for Ask Dr. Doreen. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one bye-bye for now. Thanks for watching Autism Live. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. To subscribe, click here. And if you'd like to check out some more of our videos, click here.